man by the name of John Philpot Curran made this statement, probably in a book somewhere. The condition upon which God has given liberty to man is eternal vigilance. Now, from the very foundations of this world, every individual has had to deal with taking the culture of this world and, and, and keeping it separated from their relationship to God. Now, we understand that in the beginning it was probably a little bit easier because Adam and Eve lived in a perfect environment, a, a perfect world that did not know sin, had not known uh, evil. God placed them there, but yet they were tempted to sin. They were tempted to become a part of the world. They, they, they were tempted to forget about God and what God had blessed them with and, and, and accept just the way the world was. And that's what Satan was, was, was saying. Hey, here's how the world is. You know, God created this world, but, but it's up to you. He's given you dominion over all this stuff. So you can do whatever you want to do. And, and when you make that decision, see, then you'll be like God. And, of course, Eve fell for it first. Uh, she partook of the fruit that God said not to partake of. Gave some to her husband, Adam. Adam was really the one that had the, the, uh, the big choice to make within uh, the either remaining a child of God or falling for the culture of the world uh, because he had to look. And on the one hand was God, and on the other hand was his wife. And he chose to follow his wife into the culture of the world. And that's when God came to them. The Lord came to them in the garden. Oh, what have you done? Every generation has to go through that. Each and every individual has to go through that. We have to make choices of what culture we're going to be a part of, which culture is going to be our culture, whether it's the culture of the kingdom of heaven or whether it's the culture of the world. Jesus said you can't live in both. No man can serve two masters. He'll either love the one and hate the other. He'll hold the one and despise the other, but you, you just can't. You can't have two masters, God and the world. So the tendency of human beings is to try to make sense of it. Now, years ago, there was a group of people over in England, and this was after the Protestant movement came along a little bit after the Reformation movement, but it was the Protestant movement. And they were saying, you know, this, uh, you, you have this one big church, and it's saying that all you have to do is these seven things, and you just do them, and we promise you, we, the, the church promise you that you're going to go to heaven. And there were people who, who studied that and looked at it, men like Martin Luther and John Calvin and John Smith, I, I, he could go through lots of names and they said, how could that be? How could that be? you, know, you got to believe in God and you got to obey God. And, and just limiting God to these seven things, surely that couldn't, that couldn't be what God expects of us. So they, they started once the Reformation movement and then the Protestant movement. But out of that Protestant movement, see, when, when Calvinism really took hold, people began to, to say, well, listen, if, if it doesn't matter whether I believe or, or what I do, if God's made the decision before the, the, he even created the world, who's going to be in heaven and who's going to be in hell when it's all over with, and there's nothing that I can do about it, then what difference does it make how I live my life? So the ranchers... Look it up on the internet. Look it up in an encyclopedia. The ranchers came into being. And these were people, they just did whatever they wanted to do. They, they drank. They were gluttons. 
Jews. They were adulterers and fornicators. And it didn't matter if you lied. It didn't matter if you gossiped. It didn't matter what you did because there's nothing you can do about it. God's already made the decision whether you're going to go to heaven or not. So what difference does it make if you live? Now see, that's like the Epicureans back at the time of the Apostle Paul who said, ah, well, let's just eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we're going to be dead. And we can't do anything about it. So here we are, just as I am, Lord. Take me and keep me. Keep me that way. So every generation has a tendency to make the Bible fit to them. Back where we came from, Karen and I, uh, the Amish people were starting to move in. Now, see, they take the opposite path to what the ranters would take because they would say that you've got to live like it's two generations earlier. See, they, they're not to have electricity in their house, and it's not so much the electricity. They can have generators. It's those wires coming in. That, see, that kind of reminds me back in the day when, when gas lights first came into prominence when our brethren in the church fought and divided congregations over whether you'd have gas lamps in the church or you had to have the oil lamps because that's what's in the Bible, those oil lamps, and you can't have any, you can't have that others. Yeah, you talk about making mountains out of molehills. But the Amish, you know, they're pretty, they're, they're, they're pretty devout in what they believe, aren't they? Because if you look at them, you know, the young men don't have beards. The, the men who are older or married, they have beards. And uh, they drive around in buggies. They don't have tractors. They're not allowed to own tractors, but it's all right. They can borrow their neighbor's tractor. They're not allowed to have, like I say, wires coming in, so they didn't have telephones years ago. But they could have a, a wire come to a pole with a telephone on a little box outside of their house. Kind of like Green Acres. Remember Green Acres, the, the television show where they had to climb up the pole to use the telephone? Now, now that was all right. And, but see, they were trying. They're trying. They were trying to get it straight. They're trying to understand where they belonged in this culture and where culture of the world belonged in their lives. And they're trying to get it straight. And we laugh at them. But we've got to take note. And we've got some decisions to make. Individually and as the Lord's church as to how culture is going to affect us. Now, back in the late 1800s, when uh, uh, what's-his-name, uh, gave Darwin gave the uh, theory of evolution, most of the mainline churches, as they are called, went toward the progressivism. They no longer believed what the Bible said about creation. And not only they, they didn't believe what the Bible said about creation, then it came to the point where our churches are not about serving God and our churches are not about sin. Our churches are about social justice. You know, with progressives, social justice is the big thing. So, you know, we, we're going to go over here and, and we're just going to see that, that people have their rights. You know, like, you know, slavery was the big thing back then. The abolitionists were all part of that progressive movement. They didn't need to be a part of the progressive movement. They just needed to believe what God's Word says and what the... the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence said and what the founders were saying, they could have come to the right conclusion. But see, then you know, with all these different things that are about culture, about the world we live in, not the world that someday we hope to live in. So when modernism arose, people changed. Churches change. So, the very last point that 
Jesus makes. In the Sermon on the Mount, is that we need to identify the fatal error of many people when it comes to culture and church, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of heaven. We've got to avoid that, uh, getting it wrong. Okay? And we need to really go back to what Jesus said. And Jesus prayed for you and me, okay? The night that he was betrayed, Father, they're in the world, but pray that the world doesn't get into them. And that's paraphrasing it a little bit. But here's what he says in Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell. And great was the fall. Now, you can pull out of there very quickly four axioms. Axioms are kind of like truths that you just can't deny the truths. They're, they're kind of, you know, they're, they're the same the world over. Now, you may not like them. That, that's a totally different thing. But you can't deny them that, that they're truths. And they're truths that God gives us. And what Jesus is saying here, number one, every person is building a house. Every person is building a house, but that house is being built of character. Things like integrity and purity. See? Well, we've got to be building that house. And we are building that house, whether we realize it or not. We say, well, well I'm not building that house. Well, yeah, you are, but see, uh, the house that you're building uh, may not be what Jesus wants you to build. So everyone is building it's just that we may not be building correctly. Secondly, every house is set on a foundation. A foundation. Every house is set on a philosophy of life. You are living what you believe life is all about. Hopefully that comes from the Word of God and is built on Jesus Christ. But again, the struggle is because culture is trying to take it over. Culture is trying to take us over. The culture of the world, the philosophy of the world is trying to take us over. Okay? Number three, every foundation will be tested. It's going to be tested first here by the storms of life. By the storms of life. See, the, our integrity is being tested. How do you react when bad things happen? Where do you put your trust? Do you put your trust in God? Do you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Or do you put your trust in what the world says and what the world teaches? But you're not going to find that out until something bad happens. Until the storms of life come along. And then, then you're going to see, really, what foundation you have built on. Whether you deny God, deny Jesus Christ, and just go with the flow. Because, you know, this is what everybody is doing. And number four, the only foundation, oh, I'm sorry, only one foundation will guarantee the survival of the house. Okay, so, so how do we know? You know, Jesus said these things, Fred, you're, you're saying these things, but how, can, how do we know that we can trust Fred? Well, you don't know that you can trust me. So don't pay any attention to me, but pay attention to what Jesus said. Pay attention to what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, because here, he tells us how these axioms, these truths that, that really cannot be denied, come into play in our lives. Now, in the first ten verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul showed how that the worldly, carnal philosophy of the people there in the church at, at Corinth had spoiled the purity of the gospel message. 
The message that initially had saved them had been turned around, twisted around to fit their needs, and it was no longer a saving gospel. It's almost like what happened to the churches in Galatia. See, Paul says, but uh, you're preaching a different gospel. It's not a gospel at all. It, it can't save. There's only one that can save. But see, the, the conditions of the world move them to teach, preach something different, a different foundation, really. So God had sent Paul. God had sent Apollos. And God had sent Cephas, Peter, to teach those people in Corinth, at the church in Corinth. And what they did, they started picking out, well, I, I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos, and I, I'm of Cephas. And even though all three of them came and gave the same message, say, uh, they, they were more interested in personalities than they were the gospel. They were more interested in the who's who. You know, you, you can buy those books, who's who in whatever field. You know, a lot of high school students get them. Hey, hey, get your name in who's who. Well, how do I get my name in who's who? Well, send about 50 bucks so that you can get one of these books and we'll put your name in who's who. Send me 50 bucks and I'll put your name in a book. I'd be glad to do that. And you'll be somebody. You'll be a who. Had a girl we worked with down in Waxahachie. Her name was Cindy Lou. I always called her Cindy Lou Who because she was about this tall. <laughs> they began to choose, see, not the gospel, but the who. And what Paul is saying here is that a wise builder begins with the foundation. The foundation. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11. No other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He's the foundation of the church. Not me, not you. It's him. Not any other human being. Choice for your house. You're building your house. That's that axiom, right? Everybody's building a house. A spiritual house. God says, through the Apostle Paul, you get to choose the material for your choice. Verse 13, your house will be inspected and tested. That's what Jesus said, wasn't it? Storms of life are going to come. And, and when, see, Jesus' job in judging us is going to be very easy. All he has to do is look and see how he lived his life. Pure and simple. He doesn't have to get into too many details. In fact, he's going to know. We're going to know. About five seconds after we leave this life, we know, we're going to know where we spend eternity. Because in the Hadean realm, we'll either be in paradise, Abraham's bosom, or we'll be in torments. So we'll know that Jesus already knows. He knows where we're headed. He also knows that we can change. Verse 14. A house of precious material will stand and be rewarded. That's what Jesus said. And what's that precious material? That's building on the foundation of God's Word. It's just not believe. Yeah, there, there's God's Word. It's in the Bible. I've got a Bible. It means it gets into our lives and it actually changes our lives and improves our lives. It, it makes us better persons by making us exactly what Eve wanted to be but failed. She wanted to be like God. But see, what God wants is for us to be God-like. Now, in trying to be gods and rule over others, we, we fail. But in trying to be God-like and being servants to everyone, we become like Jesus and we succeed. And our house grows. Now, a foolish man defiles his life, 
by not sanctifying it to God. Verse 17. Well, why is that? Because verse 16, he doesn't know and he doesn't care that he's a spiritual being. In fact, he can't know and he can't care that he's a spiritual being because he's so carnal. He just can't understand it. He can't understand that there are spiritual things there. So, see, he fails. And in failing to understand, and that's what Jesus is saying in Matthew 7, in failing to understand, he fails to do. He fails to build a house that will withstand the tests of this world and the test of time. And he's going to fail to be in heaven for eternity because he didn't understand God. But he didn't want to understand God. And that's the chief point for each and every one of us. That, that's where we've got to get it straight. But listen to this. Hey, there are atheists out there who love their families. Do you believe that? And they'll even say something like, yeah, you know, if my family member gets really sick and, and I just can't stand seeing them in pain, I'll go ahead and murder them because I love them so much. Well, that tells you where his foundation is at. He doesn't believe in a hereafter. So he doesn't treat his family member as if there's a hereafter. It's just a matter of, but I love them. I love them. Well, atheists can care for their families, can't they? Brothers and sisters, probably 90% or more of the family counselors practicing in the United States of America are not Christians. They care for families. But that doesn't make them special, does it? In God's sight. Atheists may choose not to lie. They may choose not to cheat. They may choose not to steal, not to kill. None of those things. That doesn't make them the children of God. They're still atheists. Hey, folks, bad people can do good things. And good people, in our estimation, can still be lost. Because they build on the wrong foundation. Verses 19 and 20. The foolish man's foundation is self and his own works. So, regardless of how well he builds his house, because it's built on the, a bad foundation, eventually it's going to fall. There's a man. I'm going to quote this man. I don't believe everything this man teaches, everything this man stands for. There are a lot of people who do. A lot of people would, would think maybe he's an apostle to Jesus Christ living today, say. Rabbi Zacharias wrote something a few years ago and, and this put this in quotes here for the beginning or well, the whole thing would be in quotes okay so a few weeks ago he says I did a lectureship at Ohio State University my beloved Ohio State University national football champions last year uh, last night national NCAA national wrestling champions my beloved Ohio State University say so, he says, I was being driven to the lecture. We passed the new Wexner Art Center. The driver said, this is a new art building for the university. It is a fascinating, listen, this is a fascinating building designed in the postmodernist view. Now, just a little bit of aside from the quote, remember that in the eight, late 1800s, it was a modernist view. God can't help you. We, we, we've got to help one another and don't worry about afterlife because there isn't any say. That, that was the modernist view. But now we've, let, we've even left the modernist view. Our culture is now in the postmodernist view. Postmodernist view of reality. And here's what the man said about it. The building has no pattern. The building has
has no pattern? That's pretty interesting, isn't it? Staircases go nowhere. They start at the bottom, even the actual spiral staircase, it just goes up and then that's it. It doesn't go anywhere. The architect, I'm sorry, pillars support nothing. The architect designed the building to reflect, here it is folks, listen to this, life. Life. This is what people are teaching. This is the culture that we need to be fighting today, folks. Not accepting and not working it into our belief system. The architect designed the building to reflect life. It went nowhere and was mindless and senseless. Now you know what you're fighting against. Now you know what your children in most of the public schools in the United States of America the philosophy that they're learning. It's useless. Nihilism. They don't want to call it nihilism because that sounds pretty bad. I turned to the, Zachariah says, I turned to the man describing it and asked, did they do the same thing with the foundation? He laughed. You can't do that with a foundation. You can get away with the infrastructure you can get away with random thoughts that sound good in defense of a worldview that ultimately doesn't make sense. Once you start tampering with the foundations, you begin to see the serious effects. Yet the foundations are in jeopardy. The foundations of our culture do not provide coherent sets of answers anymore. And listen. The answers that culture gives us and gives to our children today, they're going to be different in 50 years. Who knows what that's going to be? Believing in and obeying Jesus is the key to salvation. That, that's not Rabbi Zacharias. Okay. Believing in and obeying Jesus is the key to salvation, the right foundation for our lives. By following the teaching of Jesus, we will know, we will know, not guess, we will know how and where to lay up enduring treasures. Matthew chapter 16, verses 19 through 23. Brothers and sisters, they're not here on earth and they're not in buildings. They're investing in people and the lives of people. We'll know how and why to seek the kingdom and it's his righteousness first, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. We'll know how to avoid being misled by false prophets and false teachers, Matthew chapter 7, verses 15 through 20. We'll learn how to stay on the straight and narrow way that leads to life, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. We'll know how to fulfill the law and the prophets. Matthew chapter 7, verse 12. We'll know how to receive good gifts, the good gifts God desires to give to his children. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 11. We'll know how to judge others by a consistent standard. Matthew chapter 7, verses 1 through 6. Not to condemn, but to be advocates, to help one another. That's why we call them brothers and sisters in Christ, so we can help them. God didn't give them to us so we can condemn them and judge them and talk about them behind their back and gossip about them and have a dear friend, brother in Christ, to make a great preacher. His wife said, no, you're not going to be a preacher. The reason why? Because she grew up in a household where every Sunday at, at lunchtime they had roast preacher and roast preacher's wife for lunch. Now, she was assuming that preachers are bread. That preachers' wives are sisters in Christ. So we treat them differently. No, she understood the truth. She understood how it is. She understand how the world does it. She hoped that the work, the church would be different. But she saw what the world
world does. And then she didn't even want her husband to be a part of the church in that way. Consistent standards. We learn how the necessities of life were provided for in Matthew chapter 6, verses 30 through 34. We learn how to be free from materialism and anxiety. The world, you know what the world teaches us? The world teaches us to spend money that we don't have on things that we don't need to impress people that we don't even like. Yeah, that's where it's at. And we learn how to live a righteousness that surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. Look, your life may resemble that art center. You may have staircases that go nowhere, pillars that hold up nothing, and you may have a philosophy of life that nothing matters. And you're free to, to, to have that philosophy. You're free to have the philosophy that, that you're the master of your own faith, that you can do anything that you want to do, and, and God's going to be happy with that and satisfied with that, and it'll be okay in the end. But really, you can't read the scriptures and come up with that type of an understanding. So it may seem in this life that you're getting nowhere, and that simply may be the case. You're not getting anywhere. It may seem that you're that everything you try to do ends up as an abject failure. That simply may be the case. But what that will tell you is you're building on the wrong foundation. Because that's not what God wants you to be. That's not what God, how God wants you to feel. He wants you to feel His love. He wants you to be loved. But more importantly, He wants you to love. To do everything in love. In John chapter 8, verse 24, as we talk about this foundation, Jesus said, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins. For if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. If you don't have Jesus Christ as the foundation for your life, you will die in your sins. You will have lived a hopeless life with nothing to look forward to except eternal pain and torment. And the memory that it didn't have to be that way. It was your choice. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Take Jesus at his word. He's the one who died and was raised from the dead. I'll take his word. I'll trust in him. So I hope and pray that you'll put your trust in him. Blessing is yours. If you have need, let your request be made known as we stand and sing the invitation song.